As an animal lover and a Harry Potter fan, I often read the books and think about how much I would love to surround myself with magical beasts. Sometimes it makes me think I want to watch the Fantastic Beasts movies again, but then I get to the crimes of Grindelwald and... PSA to anybody thinking about watching those films. You don't need to, okay? They don't get any better the second time around. Anyway, I still love the magical creatures from the universe, so today I'm gonna rank them. Let's start off strong with dragons. <laughs> I think maybe dragons contribute the most to the Harry Potter plot out of maybe any magical creature, from Norbert in the Philosopher's Stone, to the first Triwizard Task, to the breakout from Gringotts. The Harry Potter series certainly wouldn't be the same without dragons. And the Goblet of Fire movie certainly loses a lot of its spark if we lose the chase with the Hungarian Horntail, low-key one of the best parts of an otherwise fairly up and down film. And look, later on we're gonna have really cute, fluffy animals that I will talk about how much I want them as a pet, how much I wanna snuggle them. Definitely don't want a dragon as a pet, okay? I'm not Hagrid, that crazy mother- What I am saying is that dragons are badass. They are vital to some of my favorite parts of the Harry Potter series. Now the downside is that I have grouped dragons together when clearly there are different breeds, different species of dragon that all seem to be quite different from one another. Some are more aggressive, some are a bit more docile. But with all of that in mind, dragons in general, we are going A tier. I think the only thing stopping it from being god tier is that I don't want it as a pet, especially not the Hungarian Horntail. Which, honestly, why does Harry need a permission slip to visit Hogsmeade, a cute little village, but not to fight a vicious and aggressive Horntail? And don't give me that binding magical contract nonsense. So from a creature that we know a lot about, and one we know very little about, the Demiguise is only really mentioned a couple of times in the books. Now I'm not taking Hogwarts Legacy or Fantastic Beasts into account with this ranking. We're strictly going off the original Harry Potter book series and movies from time to time. And basically from the books, all we know about Demiguise, Demiguises? What's the plural? Demigeese? Demi Gosh, there's a lot of them. It should be that one. All we know about the multiple demi guises from the books is that invisibility cloaks are woven from their fur. I think the extended law suggests that they can see the future, but that's not from the books, so we're not considering that. Now, given we know very little else about this creature, whether it's deadly, whether it's cuddly, whether it's always invisible or just sometimes. I mean, they say in the books that the demi guise cloaks, unlike Harry's cloak, fade with time until they're eventually just opaque, so. Maybe young demiguises are invisible, but older ones aren't? Oh, maybe demiguises are invisible until they hit a certain age, and so they can't even see each other, which means they wouldn't be able to mate. And so only when they're old enough to reproduce does the invisibility wear off, and then they can find each other and have little Demi, gosh, there's so many of them babies. Why nobody has hired me to just flesh out the wizarding world with cool but pointless details? I'll never know. Anyway, knowing so little about these things makes it kind of hard to rank them properly, but if you're telling me that I can make an invisibility cloak from its fur, even just an invisibility hat, it doesn't have to be a whole cloak. Imagine just my body going around, but my head's missing. I'm probably taking that chance. I'd take a demi, guys. I also just love that instead of cloaks being charmed, which would have been an easy explanation in a world of magic, instead of that, they are woven from invisible creatures. It's such a cool little detail. Either way, I think this creature could be higher if there was more about it in the books, but we're gonna give the demi, guys, a low B ranking. Come seek us where our voices sound. We cannot sing above the ground. I'd be open to being cast as a mermaid in the reboot TV show when we get to like season four. Just by the way, if anybody from HBO is watching. Anyway, mermaids or mer people, as the book refers to them in Harry Potter, are nothing like like Ariel from The Little Mermaid, you know? The mer people in Harry Potter is described as having gray skin, green hair, broken teeth. They carry spears. They're not like the mermaids from other stories. Ooh, Harry, pick me. I'm not like other mermaids. Given that the mer people have a chief, carry spears, wear rocks around their necks, there are parallels to be drawn between the mer people and like fictional depictions of like tribes who live on remote islands. Now, Harry does see a mermaid portrayed on the stained glass window in the prefect's bathroom, but this one is much more like the mermaids that we recognize from other stories, like a beautiful woman on a rock with long flowing hair. So maybe like dragons, there are different subspecies of mermaids, but given that the tribal mer people are the main ones we read about in the books, those are the ones I'm gonna have to rank. And while I think it's a really creative take on how to use mermaids in the wizarding world, they just don't do much else in the plot. They don't sound terribly fun to be around, and I certainly wouldn't want to go for a swim in the lake knowing they were in there. So we're gonna go D tier for the mer people. 
Imagine just having a phoenix as a pet. Just like you go to see your friend, they have a puppy, it's really cute. They come to you and you're like, oh yeah, that's just, that's my firebird. You know, just my real life Moltres Pokemon. God, you would just, you would feel like a badass. Also like, I'm really sorry your cat died. Genuinely devastated. When my phoenix, Colin, dies, it's gonna be really sad as well. Until he's reborn from his own ashes then it'll be like nothing happened. Oh, when you hurt yourself, your pet comes and gives you a little kiss and a cuddle, makes you feel better. I could get stabbed in the heart, and my phoenix would just cry on the wound and it would heal. I'd be absolutely fine. I'm not sure that's exactly how it works, but you get the picture. I would be so smug if I had a pet phoenix. I wonder if you had internal diseases, if you drank a glass of phoenix tea, would they heal you from the inside? Plus, like, a phoenix can carry basically anything, no matter how heavy. If I am stuck in traffic, I'm just gonna get my phoenix to pick up my car and fly me to where I need to go. Hell, I'm selling my car. The phoenix is just gonna fly me wherever I need to go anyway. And did I mention this is this is just a bird that's on fire, okay? It doesn't get any cooler, L literally doesn't. Okay, literally it does because it's on fire. It's not physically cool. But look, if I was Voldemort and I found out Dumbledore had a phoenix, I would just give up, okay? I'd be like, no way I'm taking that guy on, okay? A phoenix is God tier. So Grindelows are kind of like the demigeises in that we don't really know much about them. They're essentially water demons. That's how Remus describes them to Harry in The Prisoner of Azkaban. And the word demon kind of makes me think that they're from the underworld? And that would make hell and the devil canon in Harry Potter. Okay, I'm gonna need a spin-off where somebody uses their magic to summon literal Satan and the rest of the wizarding world have to come together to like send him back to hell. If that sounds interesting to you, you can't really see them. They're just out of frame here. The, the Mortal Instruments books, the Shadow Hunters. If you like the idea of summoning demons, this is the wrong book. If you like the idea of summoning demons and you haven't read this, please, it's, I think it originated, the concept of it came from Harry Potter fan fiction in the first place. But um, the Shadow Hunter series, mwah, gorgeous. Sorry, I digress. That happens way more often than you'd think. I usually cut it out, but I love talking about that series of books. So the Grindelows are a bit feral when they attack Harry in the lake during the second try was a task. And they're demons, which makes me think they're not just like, nice. You know, they actually, they crave violence. They're not just playing up to things for the second task because, oh, this is, we got to play our part. But with all of that in mind, they are the first thing that Lupin mentions to Harry during their time in his office. And that time together in his office symbolizes so much because it's the first time that Harry really learns something truly personal about his parents. And it's the start of a genuinely lovely relationship with Remus. I have thoughts about Remus and they're not all positive. In fact, they're quite largely negative. But this is a great moment. It's lovely. And the Grindelows remind me of that. But it doesn't take away from the fact that they are literal demons and they crave violence and they're just horrible creatures. We're gonna have to go D tier. So if I weren't ignoring the Fantastic Beasts franchise, Nifflers would be god tier just because of how cute they are. But basing this entirely off of what we get in the Harry Potter books, the Niffler still has a lot going for it. Mostly that Lee Jordan used a Niffler to torment Umbridge in the Order of the Phoenix. And did that indirectly lead to Hagrid being fired because Umbridge thought it was him? Kind of, but... Umbridge was prejudiced against him anyway for being half giant, okay? So that would have happened regardless. Can't blame the Niffler for that. Anyway, Nifflers are cute and they tormented Umbridge which is definitely great. That said, if you had one for a pet, it would just be chaos. Like constantly taking anything shiny from around your house. You want a cup of tea? Oh, Niffler stole all the teaspoons. Oh, you want to put on your favorite watch? Too bad, Niffler stole it. Cute, yes, but I wouldn't want to live with one. So overall, we're going to put the Niffler in the B tier. Hippogriffs bring me so much joy. Firstly, because of how majestic they seem to be. The poise, the grace, the way they bow and operate on respect. It's so pretentious and I love it. Secondly, Buckbeak takes the smug Draco Malfoy down a peg or two in The Prisoner of Azkaban, which is a great moment. I mean, long term, it almost gets Hagrid fired and almost gets Buckbeak executed. But just reading about Malfoy in agony, wearing a sling for ages. Excellent, even if he does weaponize the injury eventually. What I do often question about Buckbeak is, after Harry and Hermione help him escape, and he goes into hiding with Sirius, we find out that Sirius has him living in his mother's old bedroom. Now I'm sure Grimmauld Place is a big house with big rooms, right? But Buckbeak is at least the size of a horse, Plus he has giant wings, okay? Now sure he's in hiding, but why are you keeping him in a bedroom? That just seems cruel. He can't spread his wings and fly around in there. Let the man fly. Like surely, releasing Buckbeak into the wild, he'd be with a pack of other hippogriffs. 
The Ministry wouldn't just identify him, just know it was him. I've gone off on another tangent. If my primary mode of transport was Hippogriff, I would be happy. Hell, just having one grazing in my garden, not my bedroom, would make every day better. Just every time I saw it. I love Buckbeak. We're going god tier for the Hippogriff. Troll in the video. I thought you ought to know. So trolls are big and dumb and violent. And I don't really seem able to communicate or reason. And yet, in the Philosopher's Stone, Harry says that Slytherin Quidditch Captain Marcus Flint looked as if he had some troll blood in him. Just think about that for one second. Are there wizards and witches who are part troll? Now, I don't want to think about how Hagrid came to be, given that his mother was a giant and his father was a human. I don't want to get into the hows of that situation. But now beyond that, do some humans reproduce with trolls? Actually, you know what? Let's not open that door. Don't answer that question in the comments. Pretend I didn't ask, okay? As seductive as a troll might be to some people, largely I'm not sure they offer much outside of giving Harry, Ron, and Hermione an epic moment in their first year. Like, if I was 11 and I defeated a fully grown mountain troll, I'd be the most badass kid in school and I would never stop telling people about it. Even so, trolls in general don't bring much. We're gonna go D tier. So we don't get a lot about sphinxes from the Harry Potter books besides the final Triwizard task. They seem to be these wise beings, fairly friendly, communicative by the looks of things. Like the Sphinx says to Harry she'll move aside if he gets the riddle right, but she also says she'll attack if he gets it wrong, so maybe not entirely friendly. But when he gets it right, she smiles and she moves aside and I imagine her voice is a little bit like this. Answer my riddle and you may pass. Okay, it's creepy when I do it, but in my mind, it's like a soft, friendly voice and a nice smile, a decent riddle. Actually, as, as riddles go, it's it, this is pretty terrible, but that's, that's besides the point, okay? The Sphinx just seems fine, okay? We're gonna go C tier. A skeletal horse that you can only see when you witness somebody die. That's a horrifying concept for a magical creature, isn't it? And yet, I love Thestrals. They seem to be peaceful, Hagrid says they are clever and useful. They must be pretty safe. If they let them pull school carriages, then they're allowing them to be around kids as young as 11, most of whom probably can't even see them. Although the amount of students who must like accidentally walk into one of them and not understand what happened. I just feel like Hogwarts not telling its students about this invisible horse pulling the carriages is one of many moments when Hogwarts gaslights its students. Oh, you think you just fell over and were knocked down by thin air? Keep thinking that. We won't offer an explanation. Plus, the core of the Elder Wand is supposedly a Thestral tail hair. And I've got a headcanon that the Invisibility Cloak, not a typical one from a demiguise, but the one Harry gets, which is a hallow, I have a headcanon that it's woven from Thestral skin, since Thestrals have excellent and unfading invisibility. Although it might mean that the cloak would only work on people who haven't seen death, which doesn't quite track in the books. Or maybe it's only people who haven't seen death at the time when the skin was shed. And since that would have been hundreds of years earlier, nobody alive in the Harry Potter series would have seen death at that point, which is why it works on everyone all the time now. Maybe it's like a good wine and it just gets better the older it gets. Anyway, I love Thestrals, particularly I love how they join the Battle of Hogwarts to help scratch out the eyes of Voldemort's giants. Like I'm sure most of the Death Eaters have seen death, but Imagine if you hadn't. You send in this giant to attack the school and suddenly it starts clutching its eyes and writhing in pain, but you can't see the Thestral that's swooping in and attacking it. Or <laughs> a Thestral swoops down and grabs your fellow Death Eater into the sky, but you can't see the Thestral. So just your friend is, a Death Eater's friends? Colleagues? Just your colleague being dragged into the sky by nothing. The idea of that sounded really funny when I thought of it, but this is a universe with literal spells that levitate humans. So that's probably not actually that weird of a thing to see, particularly in a war. Anyway, Thestrals are going A tier. I, I wish they were in the books more and that they had more plot points where they were essential to it. Then they would have been God tier, but for everything we get, everything we know about them, we're going A tier for Thestrals. So our first glimpse of Voldemort is him drinking the blood of a unicorn that he slayed. And we all know how pure and wonderful unicorns are. We see Professor Grubbly Plank teach unicorns in care of magical creatures, which always puts a sour taste in my mouth because 
everyone loves it, but that's Hagrid's job, okay? Don't love Professor Grubbly Plank. Also, unicorn hair is a fairly common core, at least for Ollivander ones, and Cedric has one in his wand, I think Draco does too. And the fact that unicorn blood is a metallic silver and baby unicorns are born pure gold, they just sound so majestic, don't they? They bring so much to the plot. We're gonna go A tier for unicorns. A giant spider. I gotta say, I'm with Ron when it comes to spiders, okay? Nothing should have that many legs and that many eyes. It's just, it's harrowing. Plus, you know, the pincers. Anyway, I sort of feel like any creature who lives in the dark forest and is willing to eat children, I can't rank them highly, okay? They're horrifying, kind of murderous. We're going D tier, okay? Just don't like them. So we're finishing off with the centaurs, and I'm sorry, the centaurs in Harry Potter are amazing. My favourite bit of trivia from the whole Harry Potter series is that in the first book, after a centaur saves Harry from Voldemort in the forest, the leader of the centaurs says they should have let him die, they shouldn't interfere. And we later find out in Ferenz's divination class in the Order of the Phoenix that centaurs can read the future in the stars, they can tell you what's going to happen, but the stars are not specific with time, so they know what's going to happen, just not exactly when. Then in the Deathly Hallows, the centaurs don't engage in the war until after Voldemort kills Harry in the forest. And it's just this phenomenal moment of foreshadowing where it all ties together that the centaurs knew that Harry had to die to Voldemort in the forest in order for the wizarding world to defeat him. Now they didn't know exactly when, which is why they got a bit annoyed in the first book because they thought that was the battle that he had to die in when actually it was the battle seven years later. It's just, it's phenomenal. My favorite piece of foreshadowing Definitely in Harry Potter, maybe in anything? God, that's a bold claim, isn't it? Anyway, besides that, the dynamic among centaurs themselves, as well as between them and wizards, is such an interesting part of the culture of the wizarding world. Something I would have liked more of, honestly. And for Renz and his divination classes in the Order of the Phoenix, I love those scenes so much. I just... I have to make the centaurs god tier. And that is my ranking of the magical creatures from Harry Potter. If you want to see how I ranked the books as a whole, you can check this video out here. There are apparently some unpopular opinions in it.